I'm a dreamer, I dream up worlds that are interesting and situations that involve people in stress and danger and opportunity. One of the true pioneers of science fiction, Jack Williamson began writing the same year the first science fiction magazine, Amazing Stories, appeared. Since 1926, he has written some of the classics of science fiction literature. Over 65 works of fiction and hundreds of short stories, essays, and nonfiction works. A professor emeritus at Eastern New Mexico University, Williamson has profoundly influenced the shape of science fiction. He was the first to coin the terms matter and antimatter, terraforming, androids, and genetic engineering. At 87 years of age, he continues to write with an agile and questing mind. Author, scholar, visionary, Dr. Williamson is regarded as the dean of science fiction. That's a flattering term, and I've earned it simply by outliving all my friends. Longevity is the secret, instead of genius. Well, I think he fits in on the foundation. Uh, he was one of the earliest science fiction writers, and you know the fact that he's still writing today after all these uh, decades and still contributing important work to the field makes him fairly unique. He's, uh, he's the last of the real uh, giants who started this field. The first novel I ever tried to write was called The Prince of Atlantis. It had a nice title, and I wrote a page and a half and ran, ran out of soap. Well, for most of us who have been reading and writing this stuff for years, Jack has always been there. He has always been endlessly self-inventive. He's always been right up in the forefront of whatever was going on. And it gives people like me hope that we'll never get stale, that we can work like Jack. I mean, this guy goes on and on and on, and it's always fresh, which is pretty amazing. I'm a skeptic. Jack is almost unique in that he was there at the beginning, writing with the pulps, and then he made the transition that so many writers couldn't into novels. Then from there, he's continued. And so when many writers are saying, well, I'm too far gone to do anything new, he's still coming out with new and creative works like Demon Moon. When I was a kid, I remember making little forts and ca castles and uh, objects out of red clay mud and peopling them with, with little beings, and I used to invent improbable stories in which Jack was a, a sort of egotistical hero undergoing all sorts of un unlikely adventures. Williamson was first published in Amazing Stories in 1928, The Metal Man. I'm proud of that cover on Amazing Stories because I, s I saw the they re recognized my metal man on the cover of it but before I knew the story had been accepted. I r wrote the story in the s summer of 28 and sent it to the magazine. And it never came back. And that fall I was a freshman at the college at Canyon and walking past the newsstand and recognized my metal man on the cover of the magazine. And I'd been buying some groceries. I, bought all three copies of the magazine and left my groceries at the newsstand. It was one of the high moments of my life. And eventually, after I wrote a pathetic letter of inquiry, I got a check for $25 from the publisher, which sort of dashed my dream of sudden wealth, but I was happy to be in print, and I wrote another story. He covers the whole spectrum of science fiction from the the science fiction really in, in our country started in uh, 1926 and he started writing, I think he sold his first story in the late 20s. And it didn't, um, so he, the whole field uh, developed as Jack developed and it's, it's one of these uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg thing. How much did Jack influence some of these developments and how much was he influenced by it? But he certainly um, will be remembered as, as an extremely versatile writer for having, having done just about every sort of science fiction and fantasy. The basic reason for science fiction is that technology is changing the world and people are interested in change, the impact of technology, what might happen next. And science fiction doesn't attempt to, to 
forecast the future generally, and when it does, it usually fails, but what it can do is explore the possibilities of what might happen, and, and may, maybe we like the possibilities, and maybe we don't. If we dislike them, we, we can hope to avoid them. Probably a specific influence is that I love werewolves, and Jack's story, Darker Than You Think, was one of the first to do something imaginative with the idea of the werewolf, to turn it into something other than the horrible monster under the bed that chases after you. Darker Than You Think takes the werewolf and turns it into almost a metaphor for the collective unconscious. Well, personally, I didn't realize at the time I was writing about myself that it was just an exciting story to write. It, the hero in the story is a hard-drinking, hard-boiled newspaper man who discovers in the course of the story that he's a werewolf. And this discovery was painful to him because it involved in, in, as a duty as a werewolf to ensure the survival of the clan to kill a lot of his best friends, which made for an interesting conflict. That years later, I re realized that I was actually writing about myself and the changes in myself, the discoveries I made un under psychoanalysis. All of his work reveals the discipline of plot. His novels are meticulously plotted. The chapters close with windows. They open with hooks. He has an instinct for plot that is phenomenal. There's one ca called The Mark of the Monster that I wrote for Thrilling Mystery when they were paying a quick set of word and I was desperately hungry for a set of word and they wisely rejected it. I sent it to Weird Tales, which was a magazine I loved and admired. They published a lot of my stuff. They printed it, put it on the cover and the readers didn't like it. Well, one reader wrote, wrote in that it ran like a blurred carbon copy of H.G. H.P. Lovecraft and it shouldn't have been published. The second profound discipline that his writing reveals is the discipline of science. If we think about how science has changed in 60 years or 70 years, and we think about the discipline of staying up with it and reflecting its complex interactions with the human psyche and in human society, that's a phenomenal accomplishment. And that discipline of science, of being responsive to it and the way it affects our lives, that is something that Jack Williamson has contributed, not just to science fiction, but to literature. I wrote one pioneering st story about robots called With Folded Hands and a Sequel to Humanoids. I was the fir first to use the, the, the fr phrase genetic engineering, apparently, in a novel published in 51, a few years before Watson and Crick unraveled the code of, of the d DNA molecule and made actual genetic engineering a science, actually. It might be possible through genetic engineering to recreate us completely. And, and I've attempted to write st stories about immortal beings, but it's hard to make their lives very rewarding and profitable. I, uh, the story of immortality generally turns out to be tragic at the end. And he has given himself to the discipline of the imagination. He has thought about fiction every day of his life that he's been writing. He continues to think about it and to write every single day. That commitment to the writing process and to sharing that with readers, uh, that is a phenomenal accomplishment. There's a great deal of of things that get into work that are unconscious that you, you write without realizing what they mean or what they might mean to some future interpreter. I think you write from the whole person. You, you, you write from the unconscious as well as from the conscious. You write from your emotions more than your intellect. And the the skill, the art, or whatever is putting it into a clean, simple, effective medium. T Tad Sturgeon had a 
saying it's become famous in Sturgeon's Law that that 90% of everything is crap, and that may be true, but I think that the 10% of science fiction could be as good as the 10% of anything else. The Hugo is an award vo voted on by science fiction fandom for, for the, the best item of the year, and this one was given to me for my autobiography, Wonder's Child. And it was a total surprise when I heard about it. It's an emblem of accomplishment, of recognition. It's something I'm proud of. Art is communication, I'm convinced. And a, a work of art takes an idea and inspiration, but it also takes time and craftsmanship. But th that's something that needs to be learned if you're going to use it. It's worth learning, but it takes a little effort, a little tra training, probably. On the campus of Eastern New Mexico University is one of the finest libraries of science fiction in the world. Housing his own work and original manuscripts by other well-known science fiction writers, it has been named the Jack Williamson Science Fiction Collection. I, I feel va vastly flattered and honored People have been very nice to me, and I appreciate it. I think I'm a little look younger in the picture. Well, I think all writers have a certain amount of egotism. We, we li like to see our names in print. We like to have people look at us. It's just just like small kids need to be looked at all the time. Well, when I started writing, why? People were reading fiction, and newsstands were stacked up with popular magazines like Collier's and Liberty and the Saturday Evening Post that were printed on slick paper and paid a dollar or so a word. And there were dozens and dozens of, of pulp magazines that paid more or less a, like a, a cent a word. Mystery, mystery stories, detective stories, ranch love stories, and sea stories, and and science fiction stories and so on and so forth and, and people bought, bought them and read them and nowadays they turn on the tube. I've been teaching for years and I'm convinced that people who grew up watching the tube n never learned to, to read and write and think and it places them in a, at a disadvantage in the world. You can learn an enormous amount watching science fiction you can get visual images of anything, but I think that language is important to the to the way we we th think and talk. And if people fail to develop the language skills, never learn to organize the information and present it in available form. They're at a disadvantage in life. People who don't learn to use new technologies, especially new information technologies, are going to be doomed to, to low wages, low skilled jobs, and disadvantaged lives. There was an age when pe people who were strong and reasonably quick with it could make a good living on assembly lines and so forth. But back in the industrial age, and that's gone. Americans have not adjusted to that, to the fact that they're competing with eager people, hardworking people all over the world. And it's going to be a painful readjustment unless we l learn to train or educate ourselves to, to compete on the level where competition works. In 1975, Williamson received science fiction's highest honor, the Grand Master Nebula for Lifetime Achievement. Bob Heinlein, whom I admired vastly, received the first, and I was lucky enough to receive the second, and I, I'm still very happy about it. It's a wonderful artifact, and it's w w wonderful to be recognized. I have a certain amount of egotism, and it pleases that.
Do you believe in UFOs? No, I don't. Why don't I, you believe in UFOs? Well, it seems to me that if any intelligent being were visiting us and, and engaged in dealing with so many different people, they would make themselves known in a more believable way. They're supposed to abduct people and do all sorts of things to them. But all the individual ca cases are ca cases that really wouldn't stand up under skeptical examination. They're, they're memories of, of a sort of oddball people who are not quite normal. They, and I feel that they, they've either deceived themselves or have been deceived by the psychologists that bring back these memories of pseudo memories or, or attention peep seekers and so on so forth. I'm just generally a skeptic. So none of this uh, Steven Spielberg close encounters stuff for you? No. I doubt if Spielberg believes it himself. A novel of mine, C.T. Ship, the, f the first book about antimatter had just been published. The New York Times reviewed it. The reviewer evidently had, hadn't heard of antimatter, and he said it sounded like something out of a space comic. They were looking for somebody to do a comic strip because they, they thought a, a, a few comic strips, original comic strips that weren't syndicated, might help their circulation which had begun to sag when people were tuning in t TV on Sunday morning. And they planned four strips, but the science fiction strip was the only one they ever did. And as I said, it ran for three years. It was exciting to do, and it broke my heart when it died because that was the f first good-paying regular job I'd had. And went back to college, got some degrees, and became a college professor, and had a better life probably than I would have had doing a comic strip forever. Well, it would be nice to have a million dollar advance, but on the other hand, I'm pretty, pretty happy to sell another story and be in print. I'm I certainly not, not bitter about other people doing better because I recognize they have superior gifts in one way or another. And I just feel lucky to still be in the game after all these years. I like to say we're all born naked, screaming individualists, but we're gregarious species, we can't live on our own, so we have to learn to live with other people, we have to socialize ourselves, and that's, I think, the basic fundamental conflict, and people solve the problem, compromise in different ways and more or less successfully. H.G. Wells did it pretty successfully. He was always an individualist. He he managed to have successful affairs with good many women, including Rebecca West, and, and managed to emerge psychologically unscathed. He did better, no doubt, than I did. Well, I think the, the b biggest one is the population explosion, the probable pressure on the resources of the planet on soils and useful resources of all sorts. So it's easy to see that there's going to be more trouble than we've had. That will lead to fa famines, to migrations, to lowered standards of living, to, to wars and revolutions and so forth. There's a certain satisfaction in the fact that I won't, won't be here to see the worst of it. I sometimes f feel a little so sorry for grandkids who 
may be facing worse crises than I face today. I like to say that we're a tough species. We've survived bad times. We never lived in utopia. I think that the human race will go on and preserve a certain amount of civilization, knowledge, art, I don't think it will be entirely lost. Technology can help us. I don't think it will ever give us any final answer satisfactory to everybody, but, but on the other hand, we can't afford to give it up because it can help us temporarily. We need to keep building technology and improving it and using it wisely and not to kill ourselves. Arthur Clark told me once if I lived another 20 years, I could live forever. And I've lived probably closer to 40 years, and I still don't expect to live forever. I think that it's possible we've discovered an aging gene that, that, that causes death automatically. L lower organisms, bacteria and so forth, generally are immortal. And it has often seems to me that aging and death is a necessary tool of evolution to remove one generation and make room for the next. It's wonderful and people are excited about it, but there's been a, a so, sort of turn against it nowadays from people who got involved in internet and found they were spending a lot of time at it and not really getting anything out of it. So I'm still pretty much addicted to print and the sources of information that are available. Let's say the universe is a sort of mystery story and the science magazines, the art articles, science news give us new chapters of it day by day and week by week. And, and I try, try to read what I can to understand what I can. I've wanted for years to write a, a libertarian novel because I'm not altogether happy with all our politicians and government policies and what's going on in the world today and the Oklahoma bombing and the, the appearance of the Hardliners, militia men on TV has been sort of alarming, and I'm interested in a, a way we, we might establish an island of refuge where, where sane people and scientists, writers, art, artists can, can be secure and, and survive in the time of storm no matter how bad the storm becomes. If you're serious about it, why, if the first one fails, why don't give up, try again. If you look at the records of published writers, why, many, very few of them, let's say, sold the first novel, but many of them have worked for years before they, they accomplished it. And good luck if you want to write a novel. Personally, I don't intend to, I don't, don't expect to survive except in what I've written perhaps. But on the other hand, I'm no opponent of re religion. I belong to the Methodist Church and the, I'm a, the Masonic Lodge. I believe that we're a gregarious spe species. We, we need togetherness and direction and leadership and, and uh, tradition of, of what we've been and where we're going and so forth. And I think that religion is good for people, whether you expect to live, live forever eternally or not. He will be remembered uh, with, with, with the big names that the, the, the people uh, mentioned, like uh, Asimov and Heinlein and Bradbury. Uh, Fortunate he's been writing so long and that uh, has given us so much uh, of his vision, really. I, uh, but definitely he, he's influenced a whole 
more than one generation of writers, I mean, three or four probably. <laughs> He's been, uh, and he certainly influenced me. And most of us worry that we'll write ourselves out and we'll start repeating ourselves and we'll, we'll let our fans down and our readers won't like us anymore. And we look at Jack and we think, listen, you can go for, for good with this stuff if you've got the, the guts and the sense and the brains and the talent of somebody like Jack. So we all hope we have that. How much longer can this go on? I don't know. For years, I've felt that the, the current one might be the last, but up to now, uh, there's always been a, another. And as long as I'm healthy, as long as my mind keeps working, my, I mean to let it work. Any other questions? Good. <laughs>